You're listening to the Black Eagles podcast with Sinan Schwarting and Khan Bayazid. Welcome back, everybody! Episode 100 of the Be- Besiktas International Black Eagles Podcast. I am, of course, your host, Sinan Schwarting, live from New York City, coming at you with, of course, your favorite co-host and mine, Come by as it, everybody! How you doing, sir? Very well, thank you. Um, very happy about uh, us doing our 100th episode, you know, that we made it this far. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, I'm also very happy that it's uh, a special episode in the way that, um, of course, we, we spoke about last week. Uh, Abdullah Afci is out. Um, on the weekend last week, uh, we played against Gustepe and... Uh, um, Chanel Fidan was in charge, not Gokhan Keskin, yeah, yeah, as we had we uh, said. Although yeah, he, was, he was like also the assistant, bench, I believe. He was still, yeah, he was next to him. Yeah, they used to play together, by the way. Yeah, yeah, there was a picture, it was a sort of touching picture of the two of them in their playing days together. But uh, of course, uh, after that match, and we already kind of knew leading into that match that uh, Sergen Yalcin, the man whose name you hear every single episode, of the Black Eagles podcast, when you listen to the intro, Sergen at the Champion de Gelde, um, my all-time favorite player, my as a football idol uh, hero, uh, it's my all-time favorite player. There's nobody that comes even close. So um, I was very happy that he was appointed as the coach, um, even though he is, of course, given a very tough job at Besiktas right now we shouldn't uh, uh, ignore that but um, of course he was then later this week announced and he was also presented at Vodafone Park with 21,183 fans in attendance I believe unseen I've never ever seen a managerial presentation like that especially not in Turkey I mean I, I maybe somewhere else in another country something like that has happened before but in turkey this is absolutely un, 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 unseen and um yeah i think it's very fitting that our hundred episode we uh will talk about sergen the man who gifted us our championship glory in our 100th anniversary year in 2003. Yeah. um so khan along those lines i actually thought a lot about you in particular when I when I heard about the, the coach announcement. Of course, we both uh, <laughs> sort of gave our, our um, what's the what's the word I'm looking for? We sponsored him. At, you know, he was our choice for, for the for the job. Nominated him? No, what's the term? Endorsed, that's right. We endorsed yeah. we endorsed him yeah. for the for the for the position last week. So of course I'm happy yeah, to. And I also lived in an era. He was a hero of mine as well. Um, but I always, I mean, I, I've always remembered how much it, you, know, you liked him, how high, how high esteem, how much esteem you had for him. Um, so, I mean, what is that like to have your favorite player as coach? Um, mine was historically Ilhan Mansis. Um, now I'm kind of on mm-hmm. the cusp, I think, of. It might be Atiba, honestly. Um, but I, nonetheless, like I, I, I don't think for like just I don't have a whole ton, a lot of respect for Ilhan Mansis's like intellectual capacities necessarily. So I would, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, I, and he just doesn't seem like Sergey Yeltsin is, is. You can see he has that sort of fighter's spirit. 
Uh, it's very much like in, in him. You can see it just in his face somehow. Um, and in, in his demeanor and composure. But so, um, I feel like it's different than if Ilhan Mans is. Maybe someday Atiba will be a candidate. You know, he seems savvy and I hope so. smart. Uh, I, I certainly hope we make him a coach when he retires. But I would, I would love to see... Uh maybe 10 years down the road after a very successful 10-year career for Sergen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Oh, beautiful. I love it. I love it. Over, but uh, um, of course, uh, we have to be realistic that that's probably not going to happen. Well, but... hey, man, honestly, I, and I'll say a word about this. I mean, yeah, I loved the presentation. I love the enthusiasm within the club. And most of all, I love the enthusiasm that he has. The stuff he said has been perfect, dead on, kind of... Um, you know, supposedly he signed the contract and stepped in before they could even guarantee the money, you know, because of the Avchi step. Like, that kind of energy is obviously very, very, very welcome, especially now given all the stuff swirling around the club. Even on a good day, there's, you know, we know that people might not be getting paid. Even if it's not the players, it's like staff or, you know, like concession stands, folk, wh whoever it is, it's never good. Um, but so, yeah, you know, just knowing that this guy, like this this sort of man of the club who has the mentality to step in and, and kind of knows the significance of what he's doing and, and sort of when he's doing it even, uh, was very clear, very evident, I thought. But anyway, back to the question, like, what is it for you? Like, is it particularly special that, you know, that given that he's your favorite player and all? Yeah, it is incredibly uh, special. I mean, I I would lay I would I would be lying if I said I didn't get extremely emotional during the entire um, presentation. Just watching twenty one thousand fans chanting his name and 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 also seeing how uh, much it affected him. And I it's. I felt really sorry I couldn't be there. Um, in fact, I even contemplated jumping on a plane just to go there for that, but uh, that would be a little crazy. Um, oh, also because it was, you know, of course, announced with like, I don't know, one day notice or something, uh, which also even makes it more special because, I mean, it was a weekday uh, with, a, with just a day's notice to then get 21,000 people in the stands for this it, it just it does show uh, the amount of uh, excitement there is for this um, it also shows with, with how much goodwill and credit Sergen comes into the club uh, I think it also kind of puts the players on notice in a, in a, in a way where they know okay now if, if uh, we continue to perform as poorly as we do um, it's not going to be the coach that's going to be looked at first. It's going to be the players that are going to get the bulk of the scrutiny. Uh, even though I think they were already getting a fair share of their scrutiny uh, with Abdullah Avci even. But of course, with Avci, you knew uh, going into the season, the whole Orhan Ag debacle, it didn't start really well for him. Um, there was already a section of the crowd that was uh, perhaps a little bit against him just because of the whole Definitely, Orhan Ag yeah. thing. So... <clears throat> Yeah, uh, but Sergen, yeah, he's starting this now with with, uh, with with all the fans. I think he united the fans, and that's the important thing because I think uh, our fan base was divided a little bit. I think this will unite them. Um, hopefully, we can have a good start under Sergen, get a couple of wins under our belt. I really hope next week uh, that the stadium is going to be not full. I don't expect it to be full, but I expect there to be a good crowd supporting the team. Uh, yeah, no, and, and this is a good, uh, well, this is like a sort of table of contents for the episode too, but I think I was, you know, I've, people are sort of throwing this new board under the under the bridge already, under the bus, whatever, already, uh, and, and even I was sort of starting to maybe like fear the worst, uh, I'm, of course, unnecessarily, given that it's been like two weeks or something, but um <laughs> there have been a series of good moves this week that, to me, have really very much set me at ease. The first, of course, being what you mentioned, Sergei Yalchin, 
being hired. I do want to mention with that though, Sinan, because you did ask how, how I felt about it, and of course it's a very special moment for me, but at the same time, for many other Bishnish fans, of course, who grew up with Sergen, but at the same time, it's also scary because it's, was, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, your, it's your hero for me, it's my all-time favorite player. And you you've seen so many people crash and burn, yeah, right? Exactly. Like you don't want to see that and, with your guy. And you know that the, the the task ahead of him is incredibly difficult, and and that the fans are rabid yeah, so, so quickly. Yeah. Plus, you don't want to see him fail, but the chance of that is real, and 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 and, and no, you know every beautiful story comes to an end ultimately, and it's going to be painful if that story comes to a well, yeah, end. Yeah, and it will happen at some point, in, in, inevitably, mm-hmm. of course, there will be an end somehow. But hopefully, yeah, it'll be more of a like riding into the sunset type of thing obviously though the slant the chances are slim but but no um that is another aspect of this so i think on the one hand you know hiring him was good for all the reasons you said and just you know again i think to underscore what you said again the unification of the fan base right now is so important um and then what i also liked uh is this sort of quick business that was done right after getting Sergan. And I think what it does in a positive way is sort of take some of the heat off of Sergan. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the signing of uh, Aydin Hasic mm-hmm. and then uh, probably more importantly, as far as what it'll do Short for Sergan in the here and now, uh, Kevin Prince Boateng. Yeah. And of course, this is, well, that's what I meant by this sort of table of contents. We'll talk about all of these things in due time. We probably want to talk about uh, today's match yep. first, and, and of course, even more very briefly, uh, last week's yeah. match against Ghost Tepe. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I just I thought it was a shrewd move to make these you know quick transfers right after signing Sarah again, just to take some of the heat off of the the, the coach arriving um, for any rough patch which you'd kind of expect with a new coach and a new system and whatever else he's bringing in um you could kind of say oh but there's this new guy who's going to come in and then if he doesn't settle out oh, but there's a new guy <laughs> <laughs> so you know you have it's like a little cover in a way uh to, to for the coach which is actually i think useful uh but i i really do feel that especially with Sergan, you're going to find our fan base to be a little bit more patient and um for those who aren't other wings of the fan base kind of reminding them to be more patient or even insisting on it. Um, so mm-hmm. I feel like that's gonna hopefully balance things out for long enough for him to really settle in and establish himself. And so that's gonna be the question mark, I think, given his track record is can he settle in? Can he establish himself? And what will that look like? You know, what what does a long-term Sergei Yalchin tenure look like? Yeah. He's been signed for one and a half years, so we'll get some, I think, for the first time in his career as a manager, we'll get a glimpse of that, um, and it should be—it'll be fascinating, honestly. I mean, it, yeah, g- yeah, good start, and we'll talk about. Sagan has this reputation of uh, not staying very long at the club, so it would be very ironic if he ends up being a, a three, four, five-year uh, coach at Besiktas or longer. What? Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, Sir Alex Ferguson, huh? <laughs> But I mean, given given the arc of his career yeah. thus far, it wouldn't surprise me, honestly. Um, you know, I, I think in a way he was sort of holding out for this job for a long time. Yeah, the, the, I, I the have quickness. had that feeling for years. Yeah, and we mentioned it last week. But you know, the quickness with which he signed on and the the kind of uh, the way he did it so kind of uh, I don't want to say carelessly, but kind of enthusiastically at least. Uh, it is definitely reassuring. Um, I really feel like he's going to give this his all. Yeah, and I also um, think he deserves credit for not shying away from it because it is a very difficult task he's gotten into right here now in the middle of the season where things aren't going too well. He could have just as easily said, oh no, uh, I'll wait until summer, just put someone else in charge for now. Um, yeah. But I think he also kind of realized that, look, this is my opportunity. I've been waiting for this for a couple of years. Um, and I, I think he just, you know, 
he wanted to grab it with two hands, and he should be commended for that. I think. Uh, I think other people, Absolutely. like we saw with, uh, with with Xavi, for example, at Barcelona right now, he politely said, "No, thank you. I'll uh, wait until the summer." Obviously, that also has to do with uh, with elections at Barcelona and stuff. But still, you know. Yeah. No. No. The, the enthusiasm. You can't take that for granted. Um, but let's get into the meat and potatoes uh, to bring back an old expression of yours, Khan. Um, of this episode, uh, let's let's run through these matches real quick so that then we can kind of get into the the fun stuff. I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about Sergei and Yelchin throughout the episode. Uh, I'm glad that we took a little time to really put down our thoughts, you know, concretely there. Though uh, it, it is an exciting time, and I think for for younger fans of Besiktas who didn't see him play for the club mm -hmm. um, live. Go look at those highlights, as yeah, Khan mentioned but, last time. Even those guys, because we know quite a few of those guys who were born like early uh, 2000s, late late 90s, and, and they obviously they didn't live those glory days. Um, but I still have the feeling that they all really un understand the magnitude of, of what Sergei Yalcin means for the club. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. And, and yeah, I just mean to say, if you don't know, now you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's, it's it's important to know this. In fact, and I'm just trying to think it's, how it's many titles he actually won. Because I think he made his debut in 91, and we won the title in 89, 90, and 91, I want to say. So he won the title with his, in his debut season, and he won it in 94, 95, and then he won it in 2002, 2003. So I think he got three titles. I think as he a, had three titles, player. yeah. And, and ironically, not... The, the best run we had was the three in a row, which you just mentioned. Mm. And uh, he was only there for one of those, but to have won three, nonetheless, is all the more impressive. But he was a, um, he made his debut as a 17-year-old in that team that had just won back-to-back -back titles and were going strong on a, on a third in a row and almost made it four in a row, but dubious things happened. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's not talk about that. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. just, uh, I mean... It, but yeah, I mean, just, it's it's important. For you youngsters out there who, who maybe don't exactly know the, the significance, it, it really is significant. It's the equivalent of, you know, think of a, a club that you know about from whatever country you're in, because I know we have a lot of the diaspora in our following. Um, but you know, like if you're if you're from Spain, you know, from if, if you're a Madrid guy, right? It's like Guti coming back to coach the team, I think, you know, or someone of yeah, that or Raul, Raul, or Raul, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a big deal and it's exciting. Yeah, definitely. It likes but Zidane. let's talk it's, some it's football. Actually, it's very comparable with Zidane, I think. At yeah, 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 in a way, in a way. I mean, I think almost in a way it's bigger because he, I, Zidane, did he come up with Real Madrid? No, no, he he came up in, uh, oh, I want to say, in Bo France. Bordeaux, I guess. He's, yeah, I know Bordeaux he's from Marseille. Or, or Marseille. He is from Marseille, but I think he came up at Bordeaux. And then he went to Juventus, obviously. Exactly. So, yeah, that, see, that's where it's different. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, again, came up yeah. with us. He's a he's a real man of the club. He's an academy anyway. player, yeah. But so let's talk very briefly some Guz Tepe. Uh, we should very... Briefly, before doing that, I want to, you know, thank Kartal Oer, uh, who you've all heard on on the podcast a few times. He was here for the big decade episode, which I again highly recommend. It was one of our better ones. It was a lot of fun to record, and yeah, we got I've a lot of good feedback back and, on that. Yeah, I've gone back and listened to it a lot. It was fun. It was great to get all the feedback from you guys on Twitter. Um, by the way, keep that coming in all the time. But, um, but yeah, so he was there in Izmir to record sounds for the match. So I'm going to sort of intersperse those throughout our brief discussion of this match. Uh, but we're not going to talk about it too much, to be honest. Uh, I'm not going to do the whole lineup thing. I'm not going to do the stats thing. We're going to save that for the big match because this is we want to talk about Sergei Nyaltin's uh, tenure. But so we're just going to sort of talk about the, the major happenings, I guess. And I think, Khan, you got to talk about the perhaps lasting effect of this match, mm -hmm. which is that it has no lasting effect. It might need to be yeah. redone entirely. It's like a 
blank slate. It may Hopefully. Have, yeah, because Besiktas have appealed for a Kural Hatasa, which means um, that it's a, a rules violation by the referee. Uh, not a referee Hatasa, uh, not a Hakem Hatasa, which is a referee's mistake, uh, which is like, for example, giving the corner to a wrong wrong team or a throw into the wrong team. That's a Hakem Hatasa. That is not something that... Uh, can, that, that makes it possible to have to replay a match, but a hack, but a, but a Kural Hatas is where the referee applied a rule wrong, and that can lead to a replay. Um, now, of course, that happens from time to time. It will happen in matches, but it, it, I think it's important that that Kural Hatas has a direct impact on the score. And uh, well, uh, you know, the result obviously two one to Gostepe in the opening of their yeah. stadium, and uh, they played a good <laughs> and game. And we should mention that briefly. So, yeah. I mean, it, it was the opening of their fancy new stadium, which looks like it was in the seventies and in, in, in like a period when we didn't know better. <laughs> it's this weird black sort of square thing, but anyway, it was, it's called the Gursail Axel Stadium. Um, I mean, honestly, it's a little bit like, it looks like it's like from a Soviet Union in the 70s or something, but in a way that's, it, it, it's unique. It'll probably, for people who visit the stadium, who, who, who see it, they'll remember it. So in a sense, that's kind of what you want out of a football stadium. Uh, it probably retains the sound very well because yeah. it's got this weird mm -hmm. uh, sort of semi-roof thing good over it. Good so. acoustics uh, for sure. And I mean, most importantly, I think it's a it's a good size stadium, not too big like we have in, in like for example, I, I pointed this out on the football Turka uh, podcast. Like for example, Konyaspor, who have a good crowd. You know, they I think they average like sixteen thousand people, which is good. But then they have a stadium of like forty four thousand. So. Their stadium is like only one third full every match, and it just looks yeah, looks bad. Sure and a, uh, of course, Gustave, hey, question: Yeah, go is ahead. it big enough to match the sort of U the UEFA? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, well, requisite so that it can host yeah, yeah, European yeah. matches or whatever. Oh, Izmir is a big enough no. city; you'd want a stadium no, to do that. No, you need uh, for a final for to host a Champions League final, you have to be uh, a far five star rated stadium if i'm not mistaken and i think i believe then you need a minimum capacity of fifty thousand or something oh. uh, but they could no i i, I don't know what the, the requirements are for like a europa league or a or a super cup final because those are lower because obviously uh the the, the super cup was played at vodafone park and vodafone park is not a five-star rated stadium simply due to the capacity Ooh, um, that's too bad. But so, what about like if if Turkey were to host a tournament, you know, and they spread it out over too, a few it's cities? Too small. Too small. No, so it wouldn't match. It's only. They have to use I, the old Izmir Stadium. I think it's only twenty five. I think it's only twenty five thousand right now. But they have uh, their fans have put in a request to put uh, standing tribunes behind the goal, so that would increase the capacity, and then it would maybe go up to like thirty or something. But uh, no, it's not big enough to ho to to. I don't think it's big enough for that. I think you need at least thirty. 5,000 to uh, be able to play a, you know, a European Championship match or something like that. Ah, that's too bad. Because, I mean, it, it, it's it's a aesthetically unique enough stadium that I feel like if, if it brought enough people there, it could kind of garner a reputation. But, uh, yeah, it's a bad. little odd from that regard. But I think it's also kind of the mistake that Turkey has made why they have built so many two big stadiums across In the country. In order to accommodate that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's all because Turkey has been gunning for a World Cup or, or a European Championship for... Uh, I don't know, two decades now or something. And that's also part of the reason why they've been building these really big stadiums everywhere. But like I said, those stadiums are too big for their local clubs. And uh, I think, you know, Gustav is obviously a club with a very loyal fan base, with a good large size fan base. They can easily fill up a 25,000 stadium. But if you're going to give them a 45 or 50,000 stadium, it's going to be half empty all the time. And that's that's the thing, you know. Even even at Besiktas right now, you know, we have a forty-two thousand stadium, and we rarely fill that. We have to be honest. We, which have, is a shame. I mean, perhaps if we were in a better era, we'd have a better story even to tell. I think, uh, even I think when we, you know, when our back-to-back -back titles, we averaged like thirty-nine thousand or something. So, 
it's, it's yeah it's just you know you have to that's you have to be realistic a little bit and i think forty two thousand is good for us by the way don't get me wrong i think it's fine yeah yeah because we, we do, have ambitions right we are we, um you know business are a big club with a really big fan base but Konya Sport are not you exactly. know, with all or, the, or Ghost Tepe, which is more, Ghost Tepe yeah. are a big club with a big with a good fan base, but not that this not, league, not as big, that, not at that stage, no. Uh, and not like perhaps twenty years ago, it was even different. But yeah, not not anymore. But um, anyway, let's 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 go back to the football. Of course, as you mentioned, we did lose the match two to one. All of the goals were scored in the first half. Halil Akbunar scored a kind of nice goal in the twenty fifth minute. Yeah. Uh, Burak Yilmaz uh, gained a penalty and scored in the 38th. Diaby and then Bor- Oh, Diaby earned it. Yeah, sorry, but he Burak scored it, uh, and it was actually a very well taken penalty by Burak. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. High, powerful left uh, into the top corner. Yeah. Um, and then Borges scored in the third minute of extra time in the yeah. first half. And and that's and the, the second... goal where the Kural Hatas went before that, you know, because Tyler Boyd stayed down injured before that goal um, and the referee stopped the play. But then he gave the ball to the wrong team. The ball is supposed to go to the team that was in possession. And when he whistled, when he blew his whistle, Besiktas were still in possession. So the ball should have gone to Besiktas. Uh, but the defender who got the ball, he like kicked it up the field. So it went like to, go- to the Gustepe player. But technically speaking, Besiktas were still in possession at the time of the whistle. So Besiktas should have had the ball. And he gave the ball to Gustepe. Gustepe and then- it led directly to yeah, the goal. Gustepe then- the defender of Gustepe immediately took a long a long cross pass and that resulted in a free kick like two seconds and then from that free kick Borges scored so it it it, it directly impacted the match scoring procedure and that's why Besiktas appealed to have the match replayed now I have to be honest personally I don't feel like that's enough to warrant a replay of a match I think it needs to be a very gross uh, rule violation for there to be uh, a replay warranted like remember the Kasim Pasha match where Ryan Babel, Ryan Donk had a second ball and, and he spiked the ball the, the legal ball in play just before uh, Almeida was going to take a shot at goal that should have been a penalty uh, but it wasn't uh, that match should have been replayed that was correct <laughs> in my opinion I don't yeah. really feel like this match should really be replayed If I'm I mean I right. don't know about should or because I I wasn't aware of it enough at the time, and I haven't seen any of the replays since. So I, I'm honestly not particularly aware of it. Uh, uh, you know, as, as far as the it's, veracity it's clear of it. that there is a Kural Hatas that is 100% is undebatable. There is a rules violation. The question yeah, but I is, see, my thing is, I just I feel like I mean, it, things like never go our way, and perhaps it's the pessimist in me, but I just doubt we're gonna get a ruling in our favor. Although, hey, I'd love one. I'd love for Sergey Yalchin to get the chance to. To re-earn those three points, but for the record, by the way, if we do get to replay that match, Kevin Prince Boateng would not be eligible eligible to play. Yeah, and that makes sense. You know, and I, if... I don't know what they're. If if it was up to me, I would just if they decide to replay the match, I would suggest continuing the match at the uh, at at the point of the Kural Hatasas. So basically. At the the forty five minute mark, just start them, you know, at, at one, one, one to one. Yeah, yeah. that's that, what that, I. I don't, I don't, I don't hate it. Uh, it's like a good half of football for Sergan to get back. But anyway, um, yeah, that's it. Two to one, we lost. Maybe we'll get another crack at it. I wouldn't count on it. Sorry for those city sounds in the background, but I'm just gonna roll with this. Um, Big city life. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's just move on. I what, like did you, the, what did you think the, of the ref in this match, Sinan? Because I thought it was really bad, by the way. The ref was, was terrible. Uh, yeah, I, I he felt seemed like he out gave, of his depth, to be honest. No, like, he, I, I, I had the feeling doing. that he was... Like like he was the like he was playing the home ref. I really had the feeling that he was doing everything he could to make this a memorable night for for Gustepe. And yes, he did award us a penalty, but like every single like con- duel or, or you know contested duel or whatever went to to Gustepe. I felt like and I 
Uh, even I think we should have had a very clear penalty in the second half. I mean, uh, the thing uh, is, is that they, that they have taken the lesson that would have been learned against our Shen Ogunesh squad, and, and subsequently, honestly, Avji as well, of just like being physical with us, taking us out of our rhythm, disrupting play as much as possible. It, it, it was one of those games to the, in the worst sense. And really, you can... You can only play that way against us because you know, or I should say, if you know how kind of corrupt and terrible the referees are in Turkey, because it shouldn't be a game plan that you could like bank on going your way. And you wouldn't want to lose two or three men in a match and be that many men down because then you know you're not going to win. I um, I don't really recall as being such a match. Where, you know, your typical, okay, let's just fall them every time. Because I think Gustav were trying to play football, but I just felt no, no, it, like... No, it became that way. The second half was... The first half, ah, uh, yes, Gustav yeah. really deserved it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, they, yeah, they were yeah. the better side by far. But the it second half like was just the, the ref was playing like like he was playing wind in the wind in their backs you know just giving them like that you know how you're when you're riding your bike and you have the wind in your back how it goes mm -hmm. so much smoother that's kind of what the referee was doing here for good step it was felt, the but. wind at their back yeah yeah, by yeah. All means. yeah. Um, and, and yeah i think there was a very clear position where Najib was just being manhandled in the box on a carambol position where you know, it was very dangerous for us to score an equalizer. And I, I, I don't understand how that didn't go to VAR and how that wasn't a penalty. Um, yeah, I think in the second half we we were okay, not great. I mean, of course, we struggled with finding that goal. But uh, I think Burak had a couple of positions right at the very end. In the fifth minute of stoppage time, Beto yeah. had to make an incredible save on a Burak effort and I don't know I, I mean on one hand I, I, I'm kind of happy for Gustepe that they won their opening match in their new stadium because I really like Gustepe they're a great club yeah I mean uh, I like I like all the Izmir sides yeah any side from Izmir I want them but, to, to succeed and stay up but I do feel like we kind of maybe should have gotten at least a point here yeah no I do too uh, and hopefully you know knock on wood we get the chance but let's not dwell on it yeah um and once again, shouts to Kartal. Thank you for them sound. Uh, for anyone else who happens to be in attendance at any of our matches, feel free to send in your match sound. And uh, again, as always, please, by all means, send in some hashtag after the beeps. Uh, we've been on vacation from those for a while. Uh, we should probably get back in that habit. But, Khan, let's talk some real football here. Let's talk Sergen Yalchin's debut on the road against Rizespor, which is not an easy task on any day uh, mm -hmm. in the Turkish Super League. Rizespor is a side that, although is not like the most successful of course uh they have had success and especially against bigger sides well they're having um, a decent season i think they have like 24 points or something which is definitely fair yeah uh, and let's highlight them when we look at the table after this but um they're definitely a side that can you know kind of yeah. stick us put a stick in your spoke in your spoke uh can definitely do some damage <laughs> can definitely it's, cause an upset. They've, they've been known uh, to cause upsets. Last week, they drew against Sivaspor, and it looked like a, like a long time that they were going to uh, give them their first defeat in a very long time because Sivaspor uh, equalized in the fourth minute of stoppage time, I believe, to make it 1-1 in Sivas. Mm -hmm. So Rizaspor are... They're a tough, they're a stubborn side. They they're a really, tough nut to crack. We saw that against us as well earlier in the season where I think we played an amazing first half, but they scored like against the run of play and then they are just really tough to break down when they are, if the match goes their way, they, they, they are really good at playing compact and yeah. kind and of... And they, they have the young keeper that you've mentioned uh, us maybe going yeah. for as an option. But let's, so let's talk lineups. Let's properly introduce this sucker. Um, Sergen Yalchin's Sergen Yalchin's first lineup with Besiktas uh, it didn't really give us too many surprises, to be honest. Uh, the starting keeper was, of course, Loris Karius. 
The defense featured Doma Gojvida and Victor Ruiz, which was a pleasant thing to see, given the uh, the fact that we haven't been able to see it all that much so far, for one reason or another. John Erkin started on the left side of the defense, and Gokan Gonu on the right. El Neni was alone in the back of our midfield, with Atiba Hutchinson put in the middle of the midfield alongside Adem Lijajic. Uh, with Diaby and Nkudu on the wings, uh, Diaby on the right, Nkudu on the left, and Burak Yilmaz up front. Um, as far as Rize goes, I think the, the sort of players of note are again Kokan Akan, who Khan has noted on a few occasions, uh, and of course Milan Škoda, their striker who's you know, he has a yeah. nose for the goal, and he would, of course, score yeah. against And, and their fullbacks, um, Moroziuk and uh, Melniak, Melniak. Are I was going to say, Moroziuk and Melniak, yeah, very solid players. They have Umar, who's been in the Turkish League for a while, yeah. but maybe doesn't Still young, have the touch. like 20, 25, 26, he's very good. Yeah, and Oljan Chalayan, uh, he's, eh. he's, uh, I, I made us. him a very successful player in FIFA like four years ago. And that last time I had the time to play FIFA, um, yeah, and so I have a soft spot for him, but he's not very good. Uh, yeah, but so quick. let's talk. I mean, it's interesting he's been moved to the wing. He, he was a striker when he came up initially, but let's talk, for some, let's talk football, man. Uh, that's who we featured. Anything about the lineup that caught you off guard or... I was hoping to see Tyler Boyd. He started against Gustepe under uh, Shenol Fiden, and I thought he played a good game against yeah, Gustepe. Um, uh, I don't know. He, I think he like missed an opportunity or something in the second half and kind of got some hate on the internet again. But I really liked his performance, and I think he played well. Uh, so I was really hoping he would start here, and I was a little disappointed to see Diaby start. But, you know, I, it's not the worst thing, I guess. Uh, next match, I hope. Yeah, and I think... Diaby came out flat most of the match. Um, was better positionally than you'd expect on the wing because that's definitely not his position. But all in all, yeah, I think yeah, he didn't I, I play think well. He started well, but he was bad after the opening couple of minutes. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and, I mean, and, and importantly, uh, uh, Tyler Boyd came in yeah. somewhat late into the match, I think in the 70. 71st, 72nd minute. 71st, yeah. yeah. And uh, he actually made a pretty good impact. I think, I don't know, it, I think it may have been his directive, but Rize seemed to come into the second half much with the same approach that Gustepe did last week. They were playing physical. We were being beaten to every ball. We were looking sort of timid. And I think Tyler Boyd came in. I, I saw him sort of, I, he wanted to make the midfield more compact. He went to Atiba with the instructions, I think. Yeah, he gave uh, instructions, I think, to make the midfield more compact. And he also very clearly brought a certain physicality immediately uh, and energy, of course, which you expect from him and yeah. pace and stuff. But but again, more importantly, he kind of he fought back. You know, he, he put in a few hard tackles to let them know that they couldn't necessarily get away with doing those things. Uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, he, he seemed to play his role well. Uh, I, I I would like to point out though, like you said, you know, Riza were physical in the second half, but I, I think they played actually really well in the second half. Yeah, no, um, they weren't they weren't yeah. clumsily physical like like yeah, maybe it's not like, was. It's not like they were just trying to stop us from playing. Uh, I think uh, on the contrary, I think they came out of the dressing room looking really sharp, and uh, Agreed. I was surprised because I really liked our performance in the first half. Um, I I really immediately saw. The hand of Sergen in the way we were playing, uh, we played very differently yeah, than we did on much the, higher at the pitch. Yeah, plus something that immediately occurred to me is that while Janner was on the pitch, I don't think he had a single cross yeah. from open play. Well, and that was like when when Tyler Boyd came in saying to kind of uh, make the midfield more compact and try to play more through the middle and less off the wings. I think perhaps his directive was to do that from the start and they, they'd kind of started reverting back to their old ways and so perhaps it was more of a mm. reminder keep doing that like go back also to playing down the middle because like you're saying there was definitely far less reliance on crosses which was great and and the we will, stats we'll talk about the stats it, we'll talk about the stats yeah. after we do some analysis but uh they do reflect what you're saying but let's go on with uh some of these the the things that occurred in this match um Let's see, yeah, the 29th minute, 
Burak Yomaz scored the opener. Uh, very nice build up. Adem Lijajic with a nice one touch to Atiba Hutchinson, who tapped it in on another touch beautifully to Burak Yomaz, who slotted it home across the goal into the left corner. Uh, really well put together goal. And I think it reflected uh, a well put together half, as you say. Uh, and, and the goal on the counter, uh, their equalizer, was in the 36th minute. Again, Milan Škoda, no assist credited because I think you could say Victor Ruiz was technically the assister. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a cross that shouldn't have been allowed. Uh, there was not much pressure coming from the midfield. And Victor Ruiz was slow to get to him as he can be, as far as reactions go. Um, but... More importantly, he did sort of deflect the ball with his head, and it was just the, the worst luck. It dropped right down into a position where Milan Škoda could get his head to it if he basically disregarded the fact that Domagoj Vida was in front of him. Uh, but Domagoj Vida sort of went to defend and then just sort of dropped like a log on impact, was Definitely fouled, I think, but didn't sell it at all. I think he was being leaned on, but uh, the problem is that he didn't really go up for the jump yeah. for the ball. Yeah. And I think if he if he does, and and if Skoda prevents him from going up, then the referee will have to disallow that. But yeah. because and, Vida but, is just standing and there, and if you and jump basically... any contact, you can then kind of do a motion and make it seem like you've been impeded. You know, so like yeah, without. It, His it was a, a miscommunication between Vida and, and Karius, I think. I assume that was so, the too. Problem. I assume so, because his slow reaction, meaning Karius's, uh, it seemed like he came out, recognized Vida was going to maybe defend the ball, and then positioned himself to maybe be there in case of a deflection, which is not inherently wrong. But then, you know, obviously the, there are keepers who very decisively, and honestly, perhaps kind of recklessly, just go for the ball, kind of disregard, like knowing you're going to maybe hurt your your own player, and even the opposing player. Um, but yeah. he didn't. Do I think that. that's what he has to do here, though. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, perhaps, honestly. And I mean, it's again, right? I, for me, the keeper is always the last person to blame, and I, I I do think most of the blame has to go to Vida. I think when you're in a position where we are in right now, where we are conceding so many unlucky goals i think then you have to kind of for a while just throw all caution out be the, the aggressor yeah no i mean you yeah. want to see that but it's that's just Vida not just has to go for that ball yeah and either one of them he, sure he, yeah he can't be standoffish and just thinking that caris is going to get it i mean if it's 3-0 fine but I think right now we don't have that composure at the back right now because of the confidence level of the t team overall being a little bit low, uh, very low. So uh, we just need to just boot it away. Yeah. Just uh, boot it away. And uh, but the main the, the thing that really bothered me on this was uh, the, the lack of pressure on Moziuk when he uh, crossed it in. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I was <laughs> this is so funny because it it's happened quite a few times in la in my life do you remember that goal that Tunjai scored against us oh, where after Kleberson yeah. scored with that long free kick equalizer I do. against Fenerbahce funny that I do remember and, that yeah and, and then Tunjai was running at at us and I'm like fall him I'm just screaming at the TV fall him fall Please, him fall him, him. Yeah. and nobody falls him and then they score and I remember the exact same thing when we remember the 1-1 against Fenerbahce where uh, Emin, where, where Fabri goes up and Emenike kind of falls him but the rev ignores yeah, it and they yeah. equalize 1-1 um, there was also a similar thing where Jenk had to put pressure on Kjaer who was going to boot it up the field and all Jenk had to do was close him down closely and 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 just fight for the ball and that's exact and, and I remember just watching it I'm like close him down close him down close him down and not doing it and then that long ball comes up bam one one yeah. and it was the exact same thing I was I was basically saying when I was watching this to my screen I was like Stop him! Stop him! Stop him! Get, stop him! Yeah yeah, 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 basically, and that's the thing. Like, I think it was Elneny. I'm not 100 percent sure, but he was closing him down. But he was like standing at like two meters. Like he was just like kind of containing him, but he was giving him too much space where he still had plenty of space to cross. And he should have just gone in a lot more aggressively. Made him. He, he, sh he should have forced him to make a dribble or something. And then he doesn't get that chance to cross that ball. And and I see that too often. And we were starting this match with a lot of early pressure 
Uh, in fact, I think Rizespor did well in the opening seconds to get out from under that pressure and immediately won a quarter after like 30 seconds. But we did immediately see from the, from the kickoff the intent that we had, which was pressuring and trying to win that ball back quickly. And we were doing that throughout the first half. And then just at that point where they scored a 1-1, I felt like we kind of, like one, one of our, our players just did yeah, no, just one player not doing his job. Oh, yeah, in that moment. Yeah, no, and that was really yeah. the second half where we took our foot off the gas. Um, I mean, it should be noted also, like, goals happen. Like, people want to point yeah. their finger and blame yeah. people. Like, this was in large part down to the terrible luck of the way it, like, took a bounce off of uh, Victor's head. And, like, these things happen. A club with our quality relative to the quality of the other teams we're playing against, at the very least... Um, should be able to score more than one goal and like weather that mistake, whoever you want to point yeah, it but at. It's, it's an, you shouldn't be conceding these goals. It's a very bad goal to concede. Yeah, no, uh, it was. This it was, and it was be, this so against the play. And, but, but you say, like, fine, if we're up 3-0. I just mean to say that I think we could have been up 3-0. There were a few chances presented to us that we sort of muffed. Um, on the right side, Gokhan Gonul got behind the defense and teed up both Burak and Adam Liaj. No, it was Diaby. I checked it. It was Diaby. I only no, saw one of them was absolutely Gokhan Gunol. The, the the better the first one, which really drafted the player. Maybe the one to the to Adam Liaj was Diaby, but the one to Liaj was was Diaby. Maybe so, 100%, yeah. Because because Gokhan Gunol took the throw in. Diaby got to the to the back line, laid it off. Burak got it. Then Burak passed it to Laich and Laich shot it over. But that was a, that was the best chance we had uh, before we actually scored. So yeah, that's uh, the, the, the yeah, I'm not talking about that one. I was talking about um, yeah. Anyway, but but so yeah, that even more then that means that we had a few opportunities. Um, we could have done better. Um, we had three good. We had three. I think uh, you could say. Uh, I think we had two 100% chances and one like you know the first one that fell to Burak. Like I think they defended well there. Um, I think they blocked Burak's shot. So I'll call that a, a, a 50% chance. But the one for Lige was definitely a 100% chance. He if he hits it a little bit lower, it's a goal. No way the keeper gets to it. Um, and then, of course, our goal was a, a, a excellently crafted. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how many assists. Open play. I wonder how many assists Atiba has. Honestly, he's starting to rack them up. He had that like three in the mm -hmm. one match. Remember that? Yeah. Um, I mean, he must be at like five or something. And Lige got an assist here too today. So yeah. Well, so like let's get there. Or seven. Let's talk about it. So let's get let's get let's get into this. Um, Second half starts again. We we were flat. They were physically dominating us. Uh, Diomanda got a yellow card. He could have probably got a second one later on in the match, but uh, oh, he should have gotten booked in the first half already. Yeah, exactly. He he had a, he had a rough match. He was a ruffian. Uh, yeah, the 68th minute, o Old John comes out. My guy Chalian. So uh, I now lo no longer have any sympathy for these. Uh, yeah, Harmash comes in. I don't know where he's from. Uh, yellow cards given, two yellow cards given to uh, Rize, one of them given to their Brazilian defender, uh, Fernandes. What's his, it's like, I think it's Ivan Nildo. Ivan Nildo. Ivan Nildo. Yeah, he came from Trabzon. He got a yellow card. Second half. Again, he also, I think, could have gotten the yellow card in the first half. So they got away with some dirty, dirtiness. Uh, in the 74th minute, Diaby comes out. Tyler Boyd comes in. As I mentioned earlier, the impact is immediate. He brings energy and vigor, um, you know, kind of physical presence we need. He brings some instructions in from the coach, which perhaps do the team some good. And almost immediately, five minutes pass, Gokhan Gonu with the goal, Adem Lejic with the assist. So that's where you were, you were, uh, where I interrupted you, Khan. Uh, Adem Lejic with an assist. Oh, well, I've interrupted you like a million times already, so... <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think of that no, second but, goal? I think, I think Lige did well there, because he kind of wrestled himself in between a bunch of defenders mm -hmm. to get his foot to that ball, to get that ball to Gokhan. Uh, and, and he's been... You know, Lige has been so heavily criticized this season, uh, which I feel is kind of unfair, um, because people are singling him out even though he's always one of the guys that's trying hardest in attack uh he's always trying to force openings don't listen to um, egghead he was... egghead egghead <laughs> <laughs> no but it's it, it's a lot of people that criticize no i know him, like, that, that criticize him and uh you know you, know, you, you really was, notice was... it's always like the foreigners that that, that they sort of uh they get sniped first 
Anyway, that's... No, I feel like he gets the same treatment as Ozan did er, a couple of seasons ago. Obviously, oh, but Ozan, Ozan had a long leash, right? It took a while for him to turn. No, man, I remember Ozan, like, in, like, 2017, missing, like, a, like a two oh, chances. Oh, yeah, or yeah, when the fans booted him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that was... and, and I feel like Lige gets the same type of treatment from the fans because uh, the expectations are so big. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, here I think he was very instrumental in both goals because, obviously, on the second one he gets that assist. Yeah. But on the first he one, the he, re- the first one. Yeah, he really set, set it up. He got the pre-assist. Yeah. And uh, by the way, he has six assists this season, and uh, Atiba has four. Nice. So, uh, Lige, despite being despite being bad, Lige has two goals and six assists this season. So he's involved in eight goals, uh, and I think that's not too bad given how bad we've been. Uh, I'm saying bad a lot there, but yeah. I mean, I, I hope, and I, and I think it was quite clear that because obviously Lige missed the match in Gostepa due to an injury. Um, and I, I, I kind of felt here still that he wasn't 100% uh, physically, um, but, you know, still managed to put his mark on the match despite not being 100%. So I really hope that Sergen can get uh, the best out of him yeah, hopefully. in the coming uh, months. Well, and so uh, 83rd minute, <coughs> Diomande would come out for Borja Chuk. They have a real, like, Central European vibe, huh? These, these are folks. Um, I just signed him from Dynamo Kiev. He's a set B specialist, because I was because, so I was a little bit afraid that uh, they would maybe get an equalizer on the uh, because they got a couple of free kicks uh, around the penalty area. Um, so I was a little afraid that they. Oh would yeah, still no, find they him. they were not done. Yeah, and they very even very late into the match they were putting some pressure on. I mean, it was back and forth yeah. though. It wasn't like domination. He always, uh, saved us at the end when uh, Karius kind of spilled. Yeah, uh, yeah. a shot. Yeah. Yeah, it was a decent save, but he spilled it, and then uh, Victor, yeah, Luis, Victor cleared something it Something we've been saying for, remember, I think it was last episode, we said that there's never any one of our defenders there. Yeah, to, everyone's in slow motion, yeah. Spills it to then boot it away, and, and there. And it was great, because like, the first goal. goal was a bit of that slow motion stuff, and we saw it a little bit throughout, but at least, yeah, when it mattered, Victor stepped in. Um, in the 83rd minute, Kartal Yilmaz came in, so... There's a, a sort of side note on Sergei Yeltsin. Of course, it's anecdotal. It's only one match, but uh, he's and, and giving young did guys you a notice, shot. You know? Because he was going to put Guven on when it was still 1-1. I he did was see putting that. Gu- Guven on. And then as soon as we scored, he ran to, to Guven and to the assistant referee. I'm like, no, 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 no. Get back, get go back. back on the bench. Yeah, exactly. It was hilarious. I, I, I left. I, I, yeah, it really uh, was really funny. But he did put Guven on later, later on. Yeah, but so first, Kartal Yilmaz would come in for Adem Ljajic in the 83rd. In the 89th, Guven Yalchin would come in for Nkudu, who, uh, again, lively, active, fast, all the things you'd want to see in that regard. Bad touch, mm-hmm. a little bit rusty, perhaps, but... But, but in Morozyuk's back pocket throughout the match. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, Morozyuk was tough to in that regard. And I think... Man of the match uh, for Riza I felt Mrozyuk that they game-planned around Nkudu a little bit. Um, they seemed to try to phase him out early in the match by attacking well, him. They, they know that he's one of our main uh, our main threats. Exactly. And that, especially under Abdul Avci, was basically our, our main threat. Uh, that we were always kind of hoping for uh, Nkudu to maybe do something uh, brilliant uh, in a moment of chaos. And uh, I like the fact that we weren't really relying on that as much this match. Although I do have to say that... I'm, I'm mainly talking about the first half where I think we we played good football. In the second half, I, I think, you know, at the end, to coin a phrase from uh, our friend Aaron, uh, it was a bit of a shithouse win. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. I, I that's, that how you, that's how you got to yeah. win them sometimes. Um, oh, yeah. We, we need that right now. Yeah. And so that was it. Five minutes of extra time. Match set. Besitas victorious on the road against a tough competitor in the likes of Rizespor. Uh Let's talk stats really quickly before we wrap up this match uh interesting stats actually and i don't uh, this is a match where if you didn't watch the game and you look at the stats you'd think oh god this doesn't look good for the new coach but uh, the match didn't reflect it these stats are not a good reflection of the match um although in some ways perhaps uh the shots went to rize rize had twice as many shots uh 14 to 7 and twice as many shots on target 4 to 2 which means that Besiktas had two shots on target and two goals. <laughs> How about that for uh, clinical? Well, although, no, because they, they had seven shots in total, so they were not that clinical. Um, 
Possession went to Pesicic, though, in a big way. 66% to 34. Uh, and that is despite them having a lead for much of the second half. So that is positive. Um, passes completed 628. That might be near the top for the season. And that's good news to their 329. Accuracy, 88%. So this is clearly a style of football that we should be playing. Um, and I think that's why we didn't have to rely on the wings so much. We were moving the ball around with not necessarily ease, but, you know, we were going for it and we were trying to move the ball around. And we did it well. Um, I don't think it's not so much that we weren't relying on the wings. I think we were just playing a lot more over the ground. Yeah. We were just... Yeah, just trying to string passes together. Yeah, well, more. that's and what I, I mean. Yeah. Already kind of, we're, we're trying to keep kind the ball of moving, kind of prodding. You know, that, that's how you want to be going for. Yeah. Um, they passed that at only a seventy-eight percent clip, which is not terrible. Uh, but yeah, that was yeah, uh, not as good as us. But again, you would expect as much. They committed fifteen fouls to our ten. Uh, I think they probably should have committed. They should have been credited with like twenty to twenty-five, but another story uh but again these they played well and they weren't over the top with their fouls like maybe good step it was at parts of the second half last week um we committed 10 fouls as i said but no cards whereas they had three um make of that what you will uh we were off sides twice uh both sides had four corners so i mean in large part it was back and forth that is a i think a uh accurate reflection of what we saw out there to some extent we held the ball most of the match also accurate i think we saw that um yeah but the, all the shots they had i mean you you saw that in the second half and of course they they were down for a lot of that so you would expect it but they we did seem to uh we were weak in the second half we crumbled a little bit and that's not something you want to see obviously but we, we've been seeing that all yeah. season and you certainly can't blame that on Sergei Yeltsin and he no, actually no. responded the right way sent a guy in with instructions and we responded so I think he could have responded a little bit earlier agree I, I think that uh Diaby was like despite I think he started the match decent but then he kind of started losing the ball every single like Kind of what we've been seeing from Diaby throughout the season, really, that he can be really weak in the duels Agreed. and give the ball away too easily. And uh, I think in the second half, especially. Yeah, we didn't need to wait till the 74th were... minute. So we can agree on that. Yeah. In the first half, we had, uh, you know, moments where we'd give the ball away, but we'd work hard to win it back. And they didn't. I mean, honestly, I think apart from that bad header from Janner, which almost ended up in a goal. For Rizespor in the first half, and then obviously their goal. I can't really remember many moments where Rizespor were dangerous in the first half, and in the second half they, I can't count it on one hand. I think I have, I need two or maybe even a, fo a, a foot extra to count the amounts of times that Riza were just dangerous going yeah. forward every time we gave and the ball away. And Diaby was giving the ball away the most for sure. So that was the was right. The ball See, that's, away. that's the positive the take. One. I mean, he was slow to respond, but in his defense. It's his first match with the squad. He's sort of getting, you know, taking his lay of the land, whatever. Um, but he made the right moves. And that's the important thing. He brought in the right guy, he took out the right guy. He uh, reacted correctly to what happened on the pitch, you know, when we scored. And he sort of, you know, showed some flexibility there. Um, and importantly, again, like these were logical moves. You can say, why Cartel Yomaz? Well, frankly, we needed to. Sort of, we, we got the lead. We needed to sort of uh, control the midfield better. So it makes sense to replace an attacking midfielder with a central midfielder. And why Cartel Yilmaz? Well, simply because we have nobody else. We don't have another central yeah, midfielder. Yeah, Nejip was suspended. Nejip, and, and honestly, uh, I'd rather see Cartel Yilmaz over Nejip. He has more ability on the ball oh, anyway. And there's much more uh, potential. There's there's a project in, in him, whereas we know what we have with Nejip. And that's not a good central midfielder. Um, and, you know, we... This is a, a new, another news item that we probably need to discuss, having maybe concluded with this match. But um, we lost Ozan. We no longer have Ozan. Yeah. Oz Yakup is not a Besiktas player, uh, perhaps temporarily. I will talk about that maybe now. But uh, so, yeah, that's why Cartel Yilma. So the substitutions were the right substitutions. Um, you could question Guven Yalchin for Nkudu, but... Uh, I mean, you'd expect the wingers to tire, especially a speedy one like Nkudu. And I don't know if we had another option besides Gubinyasin to put on the wing. 
Because Jeremy Lenz is injured. Uh, calm, 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 but uh, of course uh, he would have been making his debut and that would have made two uh, 18-year-olds on the pitch at the same time. I, I don't know if you want to risk that. Uh, What'd you say? You know, I, Khan uh, Kalafat. Oh, on the bench. yeah, I mean. Uh, he's, a, he's a top He's a top scorer on our under-19 team. He's got uh, nine goals in 14 matches for the under-19 I mean, team. And he uh, was on the bench for the first time. That's a lot to here. expect from a guy in his first match as manager for the club, too. You know? Yeah, if it was 1-3, yeah, I maybe think he so. would yeah, probably yeah. count on. But uh, I think, you know, putting Guven on. I mean, you know how I feel about Guven. Yeah, but, well, and, you know. <laughs> and he was pretty terrible, honestly, in the little bit of time he had with the club, uh, with the, the team out there today. So... I don't, I mean, hopefully Sergei Yeltsin will have seen what he saw, what we all saw, and, and we'll decide that Tyler Boyd can play over Diaby. Uh, Guben yep. Yeltsin maybe doesn't need to play. Um, but again, I think it's a lot to, you know, it's good that he put in a young yeah, guy in the way of the Kartal. Out. Uh, and it's probably good he didn't take, wasn't that uh, risky, you know, giving a debut to 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 someone as well like in a, in a match like this with this with the, everything still you know in competitive yeah. if and we in the next match if we are doing well uh, the last 15 or 10 minutes that's the time where you know you put on someone like that and give them a couple of minutes uh if if, if the match is going your way um but yeah i hope uh, I, do, i just hope to see uh, ridwan yilmaz again um the next match because he of course was away with the national team now with the, the under 19 national team yeah. I think I mean so. I, I still feel a little bad for Robosho um, I bet he felt like coming to Besiktas was a big opportunity for him and you know I, I feel bad about the way it's all shaken down but mm. it, it's probably realistic to assume that whole thing is done we're not going to be able to afford him well I like Rebosho, but I, I, I can kind of see where the club are coming from too, where, you know, they're going into a... They know going into the summer, there's going to be a lot of work to do in terms of transfers. So I think they probably think we can use that 2.8 million better on another I mean, especially position. if Ridvan I, does work out. I mean, I think it's still an if. He's had one good match. And let's like, it's not like this was yeah. his first time ever playing for Besiktas. And it's not like he's got our attention previously so it's well it's this Ridvan and then of course you, you still have Janner who you who's got an expiring contract but who we're trying to extend right now and there's other options for example uh Philip Novak from Trabzonspor has an expiring contract he could be an interesting option uh, and he would be free obviously uh, I don't know if he'd be interested in coming to Besiktas especially if Trabzonspor go to the Champions League um, but It looks like he's not extending with Trabzonspor, or maybe he's holding off to see if they're gonna go to the Champions League. Uh, but that's an option, and I'm sure there's other options. I, I kind of understand why, despite the fact that I like Rebocho, why the club are not keen on paying 2.8 million for him right now. I just, you know, I think we all know we need a striker. Yeah. Strikers are expensive. We're not gonna have. I don't think we're going to have 15 million this summer to spend, so I think we need to be careful. We're going to get money in from from Kyle Laren. We're going to get money in, hopefully, from um, Isi Matmirin. Maybe from Ozhan, uh, if he does well for Feyenoord. And spoiler alert, he made and his scored. debut today. Sc scored the fastest goal in the history of Feyenoord for a player making his debut. He scored after 96 seconds. It's also seconds. worth noting he only uh, played because Orkun Kokchu was injured. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, yeah, Orkun Kokchu got a sustained hamstring injury last week, so Olsan instantly started already on his debut. Um, but I have to say I watched, uh, I watched the first half entirely, almost, except for the first like 10 minutes because the Fenerbahce Trabzonspor match was still on uh, but uh, afterwards I in instantly tuned into the the final game I watched the first half I didn't I wasn't really impressed with uh, with Leroy Fair for example so I could see uh, Olsan um, 
becoming a starter there, quite honestly, because he immediately also took a leadership role. Uh, he was very mature, played how he should have been playing for us <laughs> the last two and a half years. Um, but I wish him all the best, Ozan. Yeah, me you know? too. I mean, I think our fans have been very hard on him. I like Ozan a lot. Of course, I would have preferred to see uh, him do this, be a leader for Besiktas and someone we could build on. That was a hope. Um, but, you know... Um, it's it's football. Football is, men- is also very important mentally, and he wasn't feeling good at Bishtes for whatever reason, and that's something that's clear, I think. And uh, I just wish him all the best, and hopefully, I, can- I hope he does really well at Feyenoord, and then can either come back to us and be you know reborn next season, start off a new leaf, or he does really well and uh, clubs will pay attention and will make us a decent offer in the summer. Five million, six million. He's only 27. Uh, he'll be 28 this year, I guess. So, but I think, I still think that four, five, six million for him is realistic if he does well at Feyenoord. So yeah. we have some, some players that will be sold in the summer uh, with Laren and, and Mirren, I think are almost a guarantee that they will be sold. Um, Laren, especially. So uh, hopefully uh, we have money coming in, but I I can understand the club not wanting to fork out 2.8 million right now for Rebocho, who is good, not but great. he's no he's obviously not no Adriano. Um, I agree with everything you said. Uh, the Ozan stuff, yeah. Uh, I feel like it has to be. I don't know if I should say uh, club policy, our club's fan base policy, certainly podcast policy. To always support former best touch players, no matter what, their success will always be a reflection of our yep. club's ability to develop players. Um, the more our guys succeed, the more likely people will look to us when they're trying to buy someone next time around. So, um, yeah, for go sure. Ozan. And May, I think, uh, for example, Lauren doing well you. in Belgium. Yeah, that's great. That's yeah, great. But- Laren doing well in Belgium will maybe make it, you know, we'll have Belgian clubs coming to look at some of our players, like our youth players, let's say an Erdogan Kaya or whatever, you know, maybe (laughs) Juven Yalcin, who knows, you know, I mean, yeah, for sure. But so, yeah, we've managed to check off a few news items here. So we've got the new coach. We've talked our big matches, uh, his debut and of course last week's one uh, complete with sound effects. Um, we've talked Ozan, and so there's only two more news items, and these are the, probably the, the most fun ones, especially for listeners. We've got some incoming transfer news. I, I previewed them both, but so first, let's talk about the kid, the kid we've been begging for, mm. that we've been dying to get for some time, at least you and I. Uh, I've been, I went back in my uh, message history and uh, we were talking about Aiden Hasich back in January 2018, I think. So two, we were, we've been talking about Aiden Hasich for two years already. Um, or maybe it wasn't January 2008, but it was 2018 It's like, it's anyway. like the same, so it's almost like least... Chicharito levels of uh, repetition. Or, or not Ospina yet, but uh, yeah, we're getting there. Well, I, we, we knew we were in for him. Uh, and that we were seriously in for him uh, and of course there was a deal and uh, we had to go back on that deal because we couldn't afford it uh, where you know his signing bonus was going to be a whopping um, 2 million euros yeah. and we we cut it down to 1.2 so that's uh, that's productive yeah. yeah we saved I think we, I also think we saved a little bit on his wage so I think I believe it to- in the in total we are going to be paying him in the next four and a half years, including the signing bonus, two million four hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, euros. And it, initially, it was something like three point four million or something. So we're saving roughly, I think, nine hundred thousand euros. So let's round it up to a million. Know, and, what the hell? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. I mean, it's, it's definitely. Uh, it, it, I think it was worth not signing him at the beginning of the window. Uh, straight away, even though I think we were all kind of sitting on the edge of our seat here. Of, oh my god, I can't believe we're not going to sign. It really did it. come down to the last of... minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, plus, uh, now of course we have immediately loaned him out as yeah, well. Yeah, which and and so we would have had a space for him if we didn't also bring in Kevin Prince Boateng, which 
is an even more interesting transfer, I think, in the short term. Obviously, um, he's he's a, he'll be here next year as well. So if things mm-hmm. pan out, well, possibly. It depends on, yeah, it, indeed. If he does well in the first six months now, we're paying 325,000 euros of his wage. So that's all we're paying for him right now for these six months. And if he does well, we will extend his loan for an additional year and then we'll be paying his full wage, which is 1.7 million. Yeah. So next season, if he does well now, we will be paying him 1.7 million, but we're not paying any money in terms of loan fee or anything like that. So, and I... Um, yeah, it's... Just want to be the first on record to say that I, drum roll please, applaud this move. Um, I know a lot of people are like, oh, he's old and da da da. But first of all, he's physically. He's not that he's old. Not that old. Uh, he's 32. He's physically uh, in good shape. He's an athlete. He's a beast physically. Uh, he is a very versatile player and that's obviously what we need the yeah. most but most importantly within that versatility is his ability to play in the central midfield role we've all seen the deficiency uh in playing both ativa and el neni together so it should be a welcome addition honestly uh as far as like yeah he's, he's very versatile but mainly in an offensive way he's a but he's naturally a, a, a central midfielder but he's a definitely more attack minded than he is defense minded he can play central midfield he can play attacking midfielder he can play left wing right wing he can even play as a striker in fact uh, last season barcelona loaned him in for six months uh just to play as a pivot striker yeah. and he didn't play all that much i think in the league he only made like three appearances but it does go to show you a little bit even though this this move was very questionable and uh you know people were kind of uh, f- you know frowning uh, their eyebrow at this a little bit but it does go to show you a little bit that barcelona t- taught enough of him to bring him into that system to to play uh if, if suarez wasn't able to play uh, as the as the striker so it can't you know, be for it, nothing it come some... on like it's one thing to say he's what? not good enough for barcelona but for him to be he's even like player, relatively you know. in that conversation it means he should be way above Turkish Super League level. He's in La Liga last year. So um if he is fit, he is he is going to be one of the best midfielders in the league. Um but obviously, you know, he has to be fit. And uh he is injury prone. Yeah. So he's a great athlete. He is he's strong physically, but he gets injured easily. So, so I mean that's the he main has the capacity, if everything kind of, al- if the stars align, um, to be the kind of impact player, the Yusuf Shimshek and Fabian Ernst rolled into one uh, to maybe compel us to the title alongside a rejuvenated side, uh, you know, with Sergei Yalcin at the steering wheel. I don't know about all that, but why not? Let's dream for it. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's reach for the stars. And, and you know it's a low risk. It really is. I think that's it is. the most important because it could just be six months because... and, and only three hundred k salary for six months. Uh, if it works out, then one point seven is going to be one of our expensive salaries. But like, it's not even the most yeah. expensive. And he's a, a high revenue no, no. player uh, with a lot of ability. And so for him, for us to have made that decision means he's doing well. So um, yeah, it's it's really kind of win win. I don't see a single negative yeah. side to it. Like, what if we, if we waste? If if he's a total bust, it's just again 300k for six months. Then yeah, exactly. Then we cut him off uh, in the summer and we just send him back to Fiorentina. Uh, I think it is. I believe. I believe uh, the clause uh, for his uh, he has an automatically automatic extension trigger if he plays ten matches, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, one more thing, by the way, which I forgot to mention on the Aiden Hasic deal is. Uh, we did get uh, we did get the finances of his deal down by roughly eight nine hundred k, but the, the his agent retains fifty percent of the economical rights of the player. So if we end up selling hostage in the future for ten million, we'd only get five million. Or you know, if we sell him for twenty, we only get ten. But, so that is something that should be pointed but, out. But 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 the but initial if. Yeah, we can get ten or twenty million. It's because he's done very well, and my assumption is yeah. we have probably by then re-signed him to a new contract, hopefully. And so maybe there's a way yeah, to finagle to... our way out of that at some point. 
there's a yeah, but we would have to pay those. We have to we would have to buy out those rights. Say, let's say we we he does well early on, and we like him, and we're like, okay, you know what? We're gonna give the agent 1.5 million for the remainder of those rights. But the original deal, which was a two million signing bonus, already included 37 percent of his of the player's rights for the agent. So I think that that 50 percent is probably gonna be valued right now at around three million euros. Um, and of course, if he does well, that's only going to uh, yeah. increase. So we'd have to maybe buy out like five million or something for those rights, whatever. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and, you know, and if we did it, it would be because it was 18. worthwhile doing. So you know, I'm not too worried yeah, about it. The, the one thing, the one thing I like about this is though the fact that his agent uh, wanted to retain that much of a stake yeah, in the player in does yeah. kind of. Yeah, it does show me that his agent uh, thinks that th this kid can make it. And initially, I was kind of like, mm, you know what? I mean, Dinamo Zagreb is a, a very well uh, respected academy. They've brought forward a lot of big talents. I think I'm thinking Brozovic, Modric. Uh, I think even Rakitic maybe have come out of there. So they ha they're you know oh D Domagoj Vida oh, yeah. by the way. So very reputable. Um, so I was kind of when. He came to us. My first inclination was, yeah, it's probably money because why? Otherwise, he would come to Besiktas. You know, you have to be realistic. I mean, a, a guy that's that highly rated because he, he does have a he is very highly rated. Why is he going to Besiktas? He should be going to Ajax or he should be going to to Inter Milan or you know he should be going to a big club in Europe somewhere. So why is just he going for the to record? I, I just I'm I'm gonna be that nerd since I've already talked about my FIFA records and whatnot with Old John uh, Chalian. <clears throat> For anyone who plays football manager out there, I just I just want to get you guys to salivate for a little bit before we close out because I feel like we're we're winding things down, and I want you guys to uh, to want more, frankly. Uh, and so to do so, I just want to say, football manager guys, four and a half star prospect. And I'll leave it at that. Drop the mic. <laughs> Go well, ahead, Sean. I've been trying to find uh, someone who has scouted him. I've uh, spoken to someone who has scouted him for the Bosnian national team, but he, he did tell me you'll probably have to speak to someone who's been looking at uh, the uh, Dinamo, Dinamo Zagreb B because ah, okay. he's been playing in Croatia. So I didn't, I, I really, I haven't really found anyone who can give us a proper insight on the player yet. I've been trying my best. All the more mysterious, kind. Yeah, uh, I, I hope I can find like a Croatian scout or something, someone who's been watching him consistently at Dinamo B, but uh, so well, far. Kind. I think I think you might have to just raise your hand and be the scout because uh, now that he's going to be playing for Umranie alongside <laughs> our uh, is it Erdem Sechkin who who plays yeah. for um, yeah yeah um, so there's, there's... Erdem plays there and he has playing guarantees by the way Erdem yeah. he's already so starting there's for... plenty of reason to watch Umranie sport who for yeah. anyone who doesn't know that much Umranie is a district in Istanbul. That's not far from our training complex. Far yeah, very far. close. I mean, our our, our, our training facilities are in Umrania, I think. There you so, go. or at least they used to be. Or, I mean, I remember. Yeah, because we moved it. not so long ago. So I, I was I didn't want to like be the fact checker there, but. Uh, anyway, uh, they are playing on Monday, so I'm kind of hopeful that Hasic is gonna get a uh, get a chance uh, off off the bench. Maybe Erdem will be most, more than likely starting since he does have playing guarantees. I don't know if Hasic has playing guarantees, but I'm gonna try and tune in on Monday to watch Umrania and hopefully uh, get catch a glimpse of uh, Aydin Hasic. Nice. Well, I think that's uh, that's a good tantalizing bit of information for anyone to, to, to leave them hanging with uh, and I feel like we've pretty much covered a lot of info in a short amount of time so your heads are reeling perhaps uh, so on that note let me just quickly mention uh, where we are in the standings uh, maybe before I do that I will say that next week uh, on February 8th we're gonna be playing Gaziantep Gazishe here uh, again, very early, so for uh, for us here that's in New York on the East Coast of the United States or Canada, that's 9 a.m. So, uh, Khan, what was that for you today? What time was that? Uh, 3, I believe. 3 p.m. Uh, so that's, I think, 4 or 5 p.m. in Istanbul. 
Uh, again, check your local listings. Never trust us uh, just on principle. We, we're, <laughs> we're shady. Let me, let me quickly check. Uh, it is at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Turkey. So that'll be 3 o'clock Central European time, 2 o'clock GMT. Um, yeah. Damn, look at so that. We got early, the... early match. Yeah. Uh, and. And most importantly, uh, it's a big one because it will be the homecoming for Sergei Yeltsin as manager. So that will be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, before I hand over to Khan to do the, the proceedings, if you will, uh, I should just mention where we are on the standings. We're still in seventh place, but you know more solidly than we were before. We could potentially now, uh, if things go our way with the remaining matches, move up into fifth or sixth next week. Uh, that would also rely on Galatasaray drawing or losing this week. They still haven't played yet uh, as of our recording. Um, but yeah, so stay tuned for all of that. You know, it doesn't sound nice to be in seventh, but remember we could theoretically have a replay with Goz Tepe. Uh, and anyway, we're, we're, we're off on the right foot with our new manager, so let's not dwell too much on it. That's the most important part, yeah. Exactly. Um, and that's also something uh, Sergen said today. He said, I, I really liked how we played in the first half. I didn't, you know, obviously didn't like how we played in the second half. But the most important thing for us was to get off on a winning start. Uh, and he's right. He's 100% yeah, exactly. right. It's not easy to start a, in an away game. Uh, and it was important for us to, to get off. He is currently <laughs> the only manager in Besiktas history to be undefeated. <laughs> but it's only been one match. Um, Khan, take us up. Yeah, uh, check the show notes for Twitter handles, of course, for Sinan and I, and of course for the show. Eagles, uh, I'm just going to mention that quickly at Eagles Podcast. Follow us on, on Twitter and follow Besiktas International on Twitter at Besiktas International at underscore int. But just check the show notes, you'll find those there. Um, if you are listening on Podbean, if you're one of, I believe, 34, 36 subscribers on Podbean, uh, people, please, if you're on an iPhone, subscribe to our podcast in the podcast app if you're on a google phone or something subscribe on spotify or subscribe or, or if music. you're in uh yeah you can but not but google music isn't available everywhere for example i know it's available in the states but it's not available in germany and in belgium so if oh. you are on an android phone phone it's probably easiest to just subscribe on spotify or maybe stitcher um, but yeah, anyway, just go out and subscribe on an independent app. Don't listen to us on Podbean because I think we will probably be moving the podcast before the end of the season um, so that our hosting will become free for us as if we join the network. I'm not 100% sure. We'll be sure warning you. Uh, yeah, we'll we will. continuously um, warn you until the day arrives. And, you know, who knows that. Yeah, and for those of you who listen to Football Turca and who are maybe subscribing on Podbean to that, do the same thing because they actually moved already, so you won't be able to listen to the latest episodes on Podbean anymore. Just uh, subscribe on the podcast app in iTunes or subscribe on Spotify, Stitcher, etc. I, um, on the other hand, have something very important to add that Khan has overlooked. Which is to say, go Vesic Times! Which is to say, be that everyone. Have a good week. Stay tuned for more. As always, go by the time. Let's beat Gazi <laughs> Yeah, let's go. Let's. And hope, I'm really hoping that uh, he's just instantly going to start Kevin Pills Boateng. Just throw him out there. And yeah, then he I makes totally immediate agree. impact. Hopefully, Bula gets on the score sheet again so he can get his confidence and his form. Hopefully, Adam Leish gets on the score sheet. I am hoping for a good win against that. That's what I'm having. 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 Besiktas International hopes you enjoyed this program.